If we really take seriously the idea that speaking a language is engaging in a form of behavior, then we're led to ask, well, in what sense of behavior exactly? And what is it about action that seems so crucial here? And this ties in with what, to me, are the two central questions in contemporary philosophy. And I think, in a way, they come together. The two questions are, how does language relate to reality, which all philosophers of language are concerned with in one way or another? And the second is, what is the nature of human action? What is it, what is it to perform an action? What is it uh, to explain an action? Why is it that the methods of science have not given us the kind of results in the study of human behavior that they've been able to give us elsewhere, or to put that part more pointedly? Why have so much of the social sciences seem to be a bore and un unproductive? Now, the way those two questions come together, or two families of questions come together, I want to say is in the notion of what uh, philosophers call intentionality. Now, intentionality was a term introduced by Brentano, uh, and it is itself a medieval term, and at least the way I use it, the feature that certain mental states have of being directed at objects and states of affairs in the world is what I call their, and what uh, following this tradition I call, their intentionality. If we think of our beliefs and fears and hopes and desires, they're all, in this sense, intentional. If you believe, you must believe that such and such is the case. Or if you fear, you must fear something. Whereas for pains and tickles and itches, they aren't in that way directed. They are, so to speak, independent. They're not directed at objects and states of affairs in the world. Now. The way that that comes in, the way that this notion of intentionality ties in with the philosophy of language is this. The question that we've been posing, and incidentally in philosophy, the way you pose the question is half the battle. If you can get your question phrased exactly right, you're well on the way to a solution. The way I want to now repose that question is this. Given that our mental states are, so to speak, intrinsically intentional, they can't help but be directed at objects and states of affairs in the world. The question is, how does the mind impose intentionality on objects that are not intrinsically intentional? Because the noises that come out of my mouth, as I was saying earlier, they're just noises. The marks that I make on paper, the pictures that hang on the wall of a museum are, after all, again, just physical objects, bits of canvas with paint splashed on them or painted on them. And now we want to ask, how is it that these fairly trivial, middle-sized physical phenomena acquire this remarkable capacity to represent the world and represent it in these different illocutionary modes to, to be statements or questions or commands or pictures of Brian McGee or, or of the Battle of Hastings. And that, I think, is the point at which the theory of language and the theory of action come together in this problem of intentionality. So you get a kind of double prong with the theory of speech acts. On the one hand, by seeing language as action, by seeing speaking as a form of human behavior, I think you get a deeper insight into language. You see how, and to use a Wittgensteinian metaphor, it meshes with the rest of our behavior. But now, by taking this representative feature, this intentionality of language, back into your theory of action, you also see how actions themselves have a kind of intentionality. In the sense in which language is also is meaningful, it isn't such a move to say that actions can also be meaningful, that our intentions are a kind of representation of what we're going to do. Now, let me say, having said that, that I'm not, I'm not going back to argue for the ghost in the machine or saying that there are all these mysterious uh, mental events occurring in this queer mental medium. I'm not going back to Descartes. I think it's a big mistake to suppose that the logical features of intentionality, that is, how it is that the mind can represent the world, either in our mental states, beliefs, hopes, fears, and so on, or perceptions, or in our representations of the public kind, in language, it's a big mistake to suppose that those questions have to be the same as, the, as Descartes' questions, namely, well, what's going on in my mind? What is, the, or is, is there some queer uh, mental event occurring in my soul when I speak? So I want to separate the Cartesian 
questions, the questions about the nature of consciousness from what I take to be, what, what to me is the basic question about intentionality, namely, how do mental states represent and how do they have this remarkable capacity to make objects represent? I mean, look at it this way. How can mere things represent? How can a mere object or noise stand for something in the world? So my, my, my current research, which is a really going a step back from speech acts and, and into more basic primitive questions. Speech acts ask the question, how does language represent the world? Now I'm concerned with the question, how does anything represent anything? And that, I think, is, a, is the question about intentionality.